Okay, here's where we're going to start going through the nucleus of the cell. And the nucleus is made up of a whole bunch of parts, okay? It's not just one sort of thing. The nucleus is what we call a nuclear envelope. So the nuclear envelope itself, at the core of the cell, is a double membrane. That means there, there are two phospholipid bilayers that create it. Now, the outer phospholipid bilayer is folded into these sac-like compartments, referred to as the ER, or also called the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, for now, we're not going to really talk about that, um, but the endoplasmic reticulum is important for part of the job of you know of what the nucleus is so that's again another piece of what we want to um, discuss here and this is just the beginning of this particular um, mini lecture is sort of an introduction to both the nucleus of the cell and an introduction to sort of all the topics that follow so the nucleus at the core of a eukaryotic cell contains which we know the dna of the cell the dna is held within structures within the cell called chromosomes. So if we have, if this is a cell, and that's the cell's nucleus. Inside the nucleus, we have these structures which, that are called chromosomes. The chromosomes are made up of DNA, which most of you all know. But the chromosomes are also made up of protein. And it's really about a 50-50 ratio in terms of mass, in terms of about how much of each there is making up a chromosome. So about 50% DNA, 50% protein. People originally didn't know um, which was maybe more important or which carried or passed along genetic traits. Uh, people actually thought the proteins uh, were those molecules because the proteins are more complex. The proteins have at least 20 specific different amino acids that can be put together in different orders. Um, so like language with letters, we can have an almost infinite possibility of combinations. Whereas DNA was a lot more simplistic. DNA is four, four nucleotides, so essentially four letters. It would be like as if we had a language in which every word we can speak and all meanings were limited to uh, those four letters in all, each word could only be three letters long. So it would seem that would be very limiting. Yet the way it is is that the DNA is the code for the information. The protein is what helps organize the chromosomes, but together uh, they make up the chromosomes. Now we're going to get into the detail of the chromosomes and a process called gene expression a little bit later. And so gene expression is kind of then where, you know, toward the end of it, where the, the endoplasmic reticulum comes back into place. So the purpose of the DNA is to code for the production of proteins, not directly for proteins. I mean, they do, but they essentially DNA codes for RNA, right? So get this down here. DNA codes for RNA. A lot of times people say DNA codes for proteins, and that's sort of true, but it's, it's sort of simplistic. Not all DNA directly codes for a protein. There are going to be different types of RNA that we'll get into. There's transfer RNA, messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA. There's other types, heterogeneous nuclear, heterogeneous nuclear RNA, and there's all and there's others as well. And so they're not they don't they're not all protein. They don't all code for proteins. It's only the messenger RNA that, that does so. So DNA codes for RNA. The job of RNA, all the different types of RNA ultimately work together uh, to make polypeptides. So polypeptide and protein is sometimes used as a synonymous uh, terms, the one for the other. But the thing is that um, structurally, as they're built, we call them a polypeptide. Once they gain a function, then truly they would be a protein. Sometimes you require several polypeptides to make just one functional protein. Um, so it can be a little more complicated. So we're using just the proper word ter terms here. Um, and not kind of overstepping or over oversimplifying it too much. So DNA, RNA, polypeptides. Now, when the polypeptides are made, that's going to happen outside the nucleus in the cytoplasm. It's going to have happen in association with structures called ribosomes, which are made up of the RNA. Many of those ribosomes are actually going to attach to the surface of the ER. So along the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, 
you'll have the ribosome. So essentially, while the DNA is held in the nucleus, the RNA is going to be working, kind of doing what it does much of the time attached to the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum. And that endoplasmic reticulum is really a continuation, in a way, of the nuclear envelope, of the double membrane. It's the outer membrane. So the endoplasmic reticulum is the outer membrane of the nuclear envelope. And then it just is folded into a whole bunch of compartments. Inside the endoplasmic reticulum, the polypeptides get processed in proteins. They get modified. Other amino acids that aren't coded for in the DNA um, could be added or 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 amino acids could be removed. Um, there's modifications to them, chemical modifications, all sorts of other things that happen to really make the polypeptides functional proteins. And so the ER, that's not its only job, that's one of its jobs. So we're starting off here, we're looking at the nucleus, right? The nucleus is a structure within the eukaryotic cells that is made up of a double membrane. Now, to get out of that, you know, so we said the DNA is inside, the DNA never comes out. It's the RNA that's going to leave the nucleus. So DNA is in the nucleus. RNA is not. RNA, well, it's made there, but then it leaves the nucleus and it goes out into the cytoplasm. And then out in the cytoplasm, it may stay there or it may then come sort of back in a way and connect to the endoplasmic reticulum, which is kind of part of the, the nuclear envelope. All right, the polypeptides are made out in the cytoplasm. Now, when they're done, when they're made and actually even functional proteins uh, are manufactured, some of those proteins could be the ones that they could come back into the nucleus and attach to the, the DNA. They could stay out in the cytoplasm and be enzymes in metabolism. They could be transported to the cell's membrane and be actively moving molecules across it. Uh, they could be released from the cell itself. So, you know, where they end up is uh, a totally different kind of story uh, that we'll go into. So nucleus, nuclear membrane, uh, chromosomes. So what is a, the chromosome? All right. The chromosome we said is DNA and protein. The DNA is, we'll get into its structure in a different lecture. Kind of. The DNA is really assembled as these long strings. Okay. And the thing is, if you can imagine having a very long string, say a piece of, you know, of yarn or rope, and, you, and it's 100 feet long, or maybe it's 300 feet long, the size of a, a football field. And you need to put it in your pocket, and then you need to take it back out again often. And then maybe there are sections of it that have information written even on it. And then you need to get certain specific pieces at only certain specific times. Not the whole thing. You don't want to take the whole thing out. But the thing is, there's all kinds of problems with that. Just imagine things that you actually do deal with like that, uh, like uh, a garden hose or an extension cord or Christmas lights, things that are not even this long. But but fairly long objects that end up being coiled up and stored in some way. And often when they're taken back out of storage, they end up being tangled. They end up having knots in them. And sometimes we're kind of amazed how that happened because you thought maybe you put it away properly and, and it didn't. So this is what happens with the DNA. If this is the diameter of a cell, cell's diameter, many chromosomes are about 10 times the diameter of a cell. So the individual chromosome is really long. Okay. Now the chromosomes, remember, they're packaged up into the nucleus, so into a smaller compartment within the cell. And we don't just have a single chromosome, prokaryotes do, uh, bac bacteria, but we have many. And so that we have 20, as humans, we have 23 different chromosomes, and then there, we have two of each, so we have 46. And they're all shoved in this little space, and they're all fairly large. So there has to be some really good way of organizing them. And that's where the proteins come in. So the DNA isn't just in some random sort of long string. The DNA is coiled. But if we just made it into one coil, then if we wanted to access little segments somewhere in the middle, you'd have to undo the whole thing to get there. So instead, the DNA is coiled like this. Now, this isn't DNA structure. Remember, this is structure of the chromosome. And so now what we have here are these little circles that I kind of drew in here. They're called histone proteins.
histone proteins organize the DNA. So this would be the, the DNA. And the, the DNA wraps around each histone protein. So there's sort of two loops per histone protein. Now, the way in which these histone proteins bind to the DNA and then organize it ha has a whole number of functions which are really going to be beyond the, the scope of, of what we're really getting into uh, in this class. But to give you some idea, uh, this is an organizing function, okay, first off. So it helps the DNA become organized right, in one way so it doesn't all get tangled up. The histone proteins can then you know, attach to other histone proteins histones attaching, making the DNA more and more and more compact. But then if we want to get at the DNA, if your cell wants to read some of it, it can then detach some of these histones from each other and then unravel the DNA. The thing is it can also unravel sort of a section or a piece, not necessarily the whole thing if it wants to get at it. In between the histone proteins, you can see there are some regions where there's, there's nothing attached. These are usually binding sites for specific other proteins or molecules that are going to read the DNA. So these are binding sites for maybe things called regulators and uh, things called transcription factors, which again, we'll get into in future future lectures. So if you want to know about them, there will be a future lecture to look at. You look at transcription, we'll talk about transcription factors. But basically, if there's a specific part of the DNA that a protein has to attach to, the thing is it has to be available, so it has to be in between the histones. All of your DNA, put it this way, all of your cells have DNA. All that DNA is the same in all of your cells. So cells in your, in your ear or your eye or your toe or your stomach or your heart, they have the same DNA. But those cells are not the same and they're full of different sorts of proteins. What controls, what decides which proteins are going to be made? in a particular type of cell. Well, the decision is somewhat made at the level of this organization. Okay? If the beginning of a gene, the beginning of the information is available because it's between histone proteins, then that section could potentially, if the right regulators and transcription factors were there, be read. If it's not, if it's stuck in a histone protein, then it's sort of locked away. So as an example, say in your, your eyes, to to build an eye during embryonic development, your eye produces a lens. The lens has a protein called crystalline, a crystalline protein. You have the gene for that protein in your cells in your skin and cells all throughout your body. But those other cells never produce that protein, only the cells that made the lens of your eye. So in those cells in the eye, the beginning of that gene, the readable part, is available. And all the other cells in your body, the, the beginning of that gene is unavailable or it's locked up. Or it's locked up in these histone proteins. And then typically there may not be the regulators or transcription factors to even look for them. But if there were, it would, they'd be sort of locked away and not, not able to be found. And that's a, just a little bit of how that, how that happens. Okay, So DNA is the main molecule carrying genetic information. It's found inside the nucleus. It's organized into these little loops. The loops themselves have names. All right, we call that a nucleosome. All right, so one histone protein with the two DNA loops is a nucleosome. If DNA was cut up into little pieces, if we were to chop the entire chromosome up into sections and then just have, say, a piece of DNA, that little piece of DNA would be called, by another word, called chrochromatin. So, chromosome is a whole strand of DNA end-to-end, -end, which is really double-stranded, but it's a whole, a whole piece of DNA double-stranded with all of its proteins. That's the chromosome. If it were chopped up because we were studying it or something happened in the cell, the little piece of the DNA section would be called chromatin, and that chromatin would be made up of these nucleosomes, which are DNA double wrapped around a histone protein. And so that's what we find in the nucleus of the cell. I mean, other things too, but that's how the, the DNA is organized right, into the chromosomes in general. I mean, there, there's a lot more to it, but this is a, a introductory level course, and this is kind of the introduction to, to that topic. Right. 
So the next thing we want to get into is the DNA itself. What is the structure of DNA? All right, we're not going to get into the histone proteins and their structure and all, um, really just the DNA itself. The structure of DNA is going to lead directly to another topic, the topic of DNA replication or how DNA is copied to make more chromosomes. And this drawing here, so before I end this, we're going to point something out. In this little drawing, so here I drew kind of little squiggly zigzags as the chromosomes, but here they look like something you maybe have recognized a little more so. So if I do a little zigzag like this, that sort of X-shaped structure, a lot of times that's what you see or think of as a chromosome when you look at the cell. But the thing is, while that is sort of a chromosome, it sort of isn't as well. And that's really because it's not just a chromosome, it's actually two, but it's two of the exact same chromosome and not just two versions of the same chromosome, it's exact copies, okay? So these are actually single chromosomes joined together with a protein uh, and they're called sister chromatids. So technically that's a chromosome, a cro the chromatid, but essentially when they're joined together, we just call them by a different name. Okay. Now they, chromosomes in your cell typically don't exist in this form, you, almost never, very rarely. The reason that though you always see pictures, if you look at a picture of a chromosome, what's it look like? Someone shows you this kind of picture. The reason is because most of the time the DNA is in these long stringy structures that are they're coiled up around the histone proteins and they're kind of bound together to organize them, but that's it. They're not, they're not that dense and there would be technically invisible under a light microscope. So the type of microscope that you would have access to in a normal sort of teaching laboratory, uh, you would not be able to see DNA and you would not be able to see chromosomes. But during the process of cell division, the DNA doubles. So first we make up more DNA. The doubled DNA actually sticks together and forms the sister chromatids and, and it condenses. It condenses really, really tightly. So it's easy to separate. Again, if you have this really long hundred foot long string and you have a bunch of them and you're trying to pull them apart, it would be hard. But if they were coiled and wrapped up like yarn balls, well, then it would be really easy to separate them. Even though they're very long strands, they would be coiled up or essentially condensed into something really tight. And that's allows us to see them under a light microscope. So we see pictures of chromosomes, most often depicted in a state that they're usually not in. They're usually only in that state right around the time during cell division, right? And, and that's what we're seeing. So to kind of clear that up. So the little squiggly X's kind of that like we draw here, they represent the chromosomes in the way that we would see them in a laboratory when you look at microscope slides of cells and chromosomes and, and mitosis, right? But most of the time they would be invisible, DNA with protein, all right? So the next step is we're gonna get into DNA structure and we're gonna start with the most simple unit of the DNA, uh, which is gonna be a nucleotide. And that's uh, the next step where we begin.